In our science class, we've explored the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. But although it's useful to study these systems separately, in the real world, they interact with each other in complicated ways. To better understand some of these interactions, we're going to look at coral reefs, one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. I'm Math Dad. I'm Science Mom. And coral are not plants. Nope. Coral are not plants, Science Mom. Did you know that? I did know that. <laughs> Special hello to Kendall from Illinois, Sydney and Alaska. I see Angela and Violet, Science Mom Jamie, and Science Mom Amber in the chat. Today we're going to be talking about coral. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems on our planet. And they cover a very small percentage of the ocean, about 0.1% of the ocean. Whoa, whoa, 0 0.1, so that's one tenth of 1%? Yeah, are shallow water coral reefs, but those shallow water coral reefs actually have close to 25% of the species in the ocean. Oh, wow. They're incredibly diverse. But before we dive in, let's talk just a little bit about what coral is. So if you went back to ancient Greece, you would have some people like Aristotle saying, well, red coral is clearly a rock, a mineral. <laughs> and then other philosophers would say, you know, coral is a plant. Oh, so who was, which one was right? Or other people have said, you know what? Coral is clearly an animal. It moves um. when you touch it. And still other people have said, you know what? It's something else. It's not an animal. It's not a plant. It's something else entirely. So if you're watching the replay, I want you to give a guess. Just say it out loud. What do you think coral is? And if you're watching us live, Put it in the chat real quick so, so you is, can help Math Dad out. Is it a out. rock, a plant, an animal, or something else? Yes. Hold up Kaladin Math Dad so that we can put our four choices here. Rock, plant, something else, or animal. The suspense. What is it? <laughs> Isaac says animal. I, I'm going to go with Isaac. You're going to go with Isaac. You're going to say animal. Math yeah. Dad says animal too. And <gasps> Shauna and Night Slayer and Emily. I'm seeing so many people in the chat say animal. Jennifer asks, could oh, it be a fungi? That's a good question. Fungi fits in this something else category, not plant, not animal, mm. but coral is most definitely an animal. Okay, so that's what I said, but how can it be an animal? It's just like a rock, it just stays there. Well, not all animals move. There is such thing as a sessile animal, an animal that does not move. And to, let's think about this um, first in sort of a funny way. I have a funny example to help you understand how coral works. And that, that example involves math dad. Hey, you're saying I look funny? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pretend that math dad had an identical twin brother. Oh, that's twice as good. Would there be two math dads? No, not really. They would be different people, right? They would have different names, but they would have the same genetic information, which is pretty cool. That's okay. the cool thing about identical twins. Now, what if instead of there just being two identical animals, identical people, what if we had a whole bunch? Let's say we had 500 math dads. Oh, oh, oh. And what if those people actually secreted a calcium kind of skeleton at the bottom of their bodies that <laughs> locked them in place so they couldn't move? Wait a minute. Now it's sounding that, not so fun, yeah, right? That, that, that would not be so cool, but okay. We're... And since they can't <laughs> move, they also have like a little garden on top of their heads where they grow all their food. This is kind of like what a coral is. Now, when I'm talking about math dad in this example, it sounds ridiculous, but hopefully it will help you remember that coral are a colony of tiny little animals. They are genetically identical to each other. So it's a colony of, of clones, clones all living together and they grow their own food. They're like tiny little animal farmers. Well, Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. You said, so they're distinct individuals? Yes but they share the same DNA That's what you're, when you say they're clones? Yep. Oh man. So when you look at a piece of coral, that entire coral, you might say like, aha, this coral is an animal. Well, it's actually a collection of hundreds of animals that are all genetically identical to each other. A full colony. A colony. Huh, I, I hope I like myself if I'm gonna be a clone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not as complex a system as, you know, 500 math dads all locked in cement growing broccoli on their heads <laughs> because the animal that makes up coral is related to jellyfish. So let's take a look really fast at jellyfish. 
Jellyfish are a type of animal called a cnidarian. They're very simple animals. They don't have eyes. They don't have the same complex structure that we do. They don't even have a skeleton. But a jellyfish, when it goes through its life cycle, Math Dad, did you know that for part of the jelly's life cycle, it's a larva and it lives upside down on a rock? Are you serious? I'm serious. All jellyfish do this? Pretty much all jellyfish do this. Okay, so I had no idea. The jellyfish is, is born. It's this tiny little thing. It lands on a rock. It lives there for a little while as a larva upside down with its tentacles facing up and its mouth here. And then it goes through this little metamorphosis process and becomes a free floating animal. Now, Ooh. if you take a jellyfish, which has this sort of round part here, it has tentacles that sting and these tentacles that sting bring food into its mouth. If you take a jellyfish and you turn it upside down, it looks a lot like a coral polyp. Whoa. <gasps> so, so this- the, the cor Coral is stationary though. Yes, coral is stationary, stationary or sessile, which means it does not move. So this is a, sorry, my pen wasn't quite working right, a polyp. Poilp. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness, and I spelled it wrong. You Strike guys. one, science mom. Strike <laughs> let one. Me, let me erase it and try that again. Destro I can, destroy the evidence. I can, I can spell polyp. Polyp. There we go. This is a coral polyp, and it is a lot like a jellyfish, except upside down and not floating around. So it lives on a hard surface, and it creates this kind of like calcium secretion. A lot of corals do. Not every coral, but a lot of them that kind of builds up over time and it's like a little calcium skeleton down here. And if it needs to, it can even pull itself down and kind of hide. It can kind of withdraw and hide a little bit and protect itself by drawing down inside its skeleton. So it does move a bit. It can. And if you, if you were to touch these little tentacles that are out, if you touch them with your finger, you might get stung because they do some types of coral have stinging cells. And if the coral felt like it was threatened, it definitely would move those tentacles away and be like, uh-oh, something's trying to attack us. And this is why certain, certain people, even back in time where there were ancient Egyptians and in ancient Greece, a long time ago, this is why you had some people arguing that coral was a plant and some people arguing that it was an animal because people would dive underwater and see these beautiful coral and they do look like plants. They stay in one place. They're not moving around all over the floor. Right. But if you touch the tentacles of a coral, they will move and respond. So that was the main reason that some people were arguing that they were animals. So it's lots of different animals, not just one not individual. Just one. So that, that's kind of cool. Now, how do we know that they're animals? The answer really is microscopes and looking at the cells. Now let's take a look at our, our diagram again real quick. So coral is a whole bunch of polyps and that's this individual thing living together. And inside the polyp, you have a different type of cell. You have algae that can do photosynthesis. And so coral is a symbiotic relationship. It has a symbiotic relationship with the algae and it gives the algae a safe home and a little bit of extra carbon dioxide and some nitrogen. And then the algae in return gives the coral sugars and food. Most coral, 90% of all of their energy comes from these cells. So the algae- That are is, living is, inside them. Is feeding the coral and the coral is doing what for the algae? Protecting it and giving, giving it a home and giving it nutrients. So it benefits both of them very well. The, the coral gives the algae a home, a safe place to be where, you know, fish and other filter feeders aren't gonna come and eat it. And the coral also says, here you go, you want carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis? I'll give you some extra because I don't need it. And oh, you want a little extra nitrogen? Here you go, you can have this too. So it's a good, a good deal for both the coral and the algae. And this algae has a really cool name. To find out the name, we are gonna go to the notes real fast. Okay. So in the notes, and so this is on page M. Chen 104. Wears, points out that they look like mini pizzas. So. <laughs> they kind of do look like mini pizzas. On page 104, we have a little diagram about coral reefs. And math dad, let's see how good you are. Can you figure out these mixed up words? 
Oh no, these are always so hard. They, they look easy. You'd think you'd be able to do this, but okay. Help them out Mal in the chat, you guys. Malikyu. Um, <laughs> so we were talking about coral reefs be being some of the most diverse ecosystems on earth and how we have an intersection of the biosphere, you know, because these are living things, but also they're influencing the hydrosphere and coral reefs become limestone. And limestone is hmm. made mostly of calcium. There you go. That's oh, your man. And Sam and Kunalin and Jennifer all have it in the chat as well. All right. Up next, Terra Heart. Uh, try Earth. Oh, but Heart works too. Heart okay. does work too. All right. Now, if you, and we'll leave the other two for you to fill out on your own, but mm. if you fill these all out, it helps you to put in the cool name of these algae. And it is Zoxanthellae. Zoxanthellae? Zoxanthellae. I, I love it when the letter X sounds like a Z. It just sounds so cool. It really does. And you know what? I just forgot how to spell it. Zoxanthellae. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Leave it for them to figure out. <laughs> You'll have to figure it out. Because sometimes when you're teaching live, it can be, you can get like caught off yeah. guard. And then well, you, you, don't, you don't want to get it wrong. And you don't want to spoil it for them. So. No, you'll have to figure it out. But zoxanthellae is how you say it. So zoxanthellae are those little microscopic algae that the coral have that relationship with, where they give them almost, you know, 90% of most coral, 90% of their food comes from the algae. All right, back to our slideshow real fast. We have a couple cool different types of coral to show you, and then we are going to get to our quiz show. So the first one is staghorn coral. This is one of the main corals in the Caribbean and in tropical reefs, and it is a hard coral. That means that it has a really strong skeleton of calcium that it builds. And as the staghorn coral grows, tiny little bits of the coral might break off and kind of land down around the base. And you have, you know, other tiny little crustaceans and shrimps and animals. When they die and their little skeletons form around the base, you get this deposit of calcium carbonate that grows and grows. And over time, the reef can grow out and up and you get limestone being formed. Another type of coral that is not a hard coral, this one is a soft coral, it does not have a big calcium skeleton, this is bubble coral. I bet I know where it gets its name from. And those, <laughs> those sacks, they get bigger um, during the day and smaller at night. They have algae in them as well, so they, these have a symbiotic relationship with algae too, and it does not look anything like the staghorn coral. Not at all. There is so much diversity in coral. Wait, how do they even know they're the same species then? By Good. by looking at the DNA, by looking at the structure of the cells, and by looking at the life cycle, how the coral reproduces, all those are clues to, sh to tell you this is a coral. But you're right. If you did not have microscopes and tools to analyze DNA, if you were living back in ancient Greece, you probably wouldn't put bubble coral and staghorn coral in the same family because no. they look very different. But they each have relationships with algae and do that symbiotic relationship the, the same way. Our next animal is tree coral. This one Ooh. is also a soft coral. It does not have a hard skeleton like the staghorn coral. I, I know where this one got its name too. They, they did a good job naming these. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a lot like a tree, right? Yeah. There are lots of different species of these. Some of them live deep underground. And there's a related species to this where instead of just tiny little branches that have smaller branches on them with the little polyps, you actually have them merged together and it looks like a big fan. Ooh. But you can't get with this what the common name of this one is. Is it sea fan coral? <laughs> it is a sea fan. Aren't those beautiful? Yeah, it is. And now, it grows naturally like that. Yes. And it, that's really an entire colony of little clones. Is, is that correct? It really is, which cool. is amazing. The shapes and the variety that you have with coral are incredible. Now, most coral need to live somewhere with shallow waters so that they can get light because they're, they're essentially little farmers and they have their bodies packed full of this algae and the algae has to do photosynthesis so they oh. have to have light. So the coral doesn't need the light, but the algae that's the supplying algae its does. food needs light? Yes. Okay. But there, that's not the case with every coral. There are some coral that live deep in the ocean, down up to a thousand meters below sea level where there's no light at all. 
The only <laughs> reason we can see light here and we're able to see this picture is because this was taken from an underwater submersible and you can see it's shining a little laser out right here that tells it how close it is to, you know, make sure it doesn't run into anything. And then it has lights that help help it kind of navigate around. This is the Rost Reef off the coast of Norway. And this coral reef is enormous, more than 43 kilometers long, more than seven kilometers wide. And it's all built of coral that does not do photosynthesis. It doesn't have that algae that does photosynthesis. It has a different type of algae. And as nutrients wash over the coral, um, and maybe algae isn't quite the right word, it also has a symbiotic relationship with some single-celled animals that live inside it. And it's just picking up nutrients from deep waters that are coming up, and it grows very slowly. But the, since it's there and there's this big system of a coral reef, there are a lot of fish and other animals that live there too. So they're able to get food all the way down there. From the, the nutrient-rich water that's coming up. Yeah. Cool. Kind of amazing, right? Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about coral bleaching. Uh, I saw somebody talking about this in the chat. So. Yes. So this first thing that you need to understand about coral bleaching is that this is something that happens naturally and that the relationship between algae and the coral, it's a little bit of a tricky one, a little bit of a delicate one. So the coral is providing a garden for this algae, right? And what would you do, Math Dad, if you had a garden and all of a sudden you had some strange, um, I don't know, like the weather changed and all of your tomato plants just started going crazy and they were producing poisonous turnips instead of tomatoes. Oh man, well I'd pull out those tomato plants. Yeah, you'd be like, get out of here. <laughs> You're ruining my garden. That happens with coral too. If the conditions are right, then the algae inside the coral is, it's giving the coral sugars just nonstop. Like, here you go, you want some food, here's some more food. But if the conditions are not right, and if it gets too hot or too cold, or if the water suddenly becomes less salty, then the algae will change and it will be like, you know what, instead of making sugar today, I wanna make something slightly poisonous. And it oh. starts making slightly poisonous things instead of sugars. So what, what would you do if that happened to you? You'd be like, get out of here. That, and that's, that's, right. that's exactly what the coral does. As soon as the algae starts making those slightly poisonous compounds, it says, all right, you're done, evicted, get out and it ejects all of the algae. So, but then it won't have any food. Yes. So this is bad. It is bad for the coral. So if it, the stress that caused that relationship to kind of go sour, if that stress is short and just for a few weeks, then as soon as the coral kind of gets the sense like, okay, I think we can try this again, it will bring algae back in and things will go back to normal and the coral will recover. Sometimes the coral will bring in new algae so it would have had one species of algae before and then it bleaches and gets stressed. And then it will be like, you know what? Those like crazy turnip producing tomato plants were horrible. Let's try artichokes instead. And it brings in a different type of algae. You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. I need a new algae. But other times it will bring back the same algae. If the bleaching happens for too long though, if you go like eight weeks, the coral will starve to death and it will die. Because because it needs that algae yeah, for its food. Most of its food comes from the algae. So back to our, our picture real fast. This algae right here, um, you can see that one of the corals bleached, it kicked out its algae, but the one right behind it, which is the same, same variety, didn't. So this could have been caused by maybe, maybe there was some sort of pollution event. Or, you know, who knows? There are a lot of different things that can cause a coral to experience this, but it was just this one coral that bleached. But other times you have mass bleaching events where an entire coral reef will, will go white. And one of the most dramatic examples of this was on the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef has had a couple bleaching events where the entire reef, which is one of the, the biggest, most robust coral reefs in the world. Is this on Australia? down off the coast of Australia has turned, you know, kilometers of it have turned completely white. Oh, that's, that's kind of sad. Look how beautiful it is on the left there, but on the right, it looks kind of barren yeah. and lifeless. No, it's definitely kind of a, a scary thing. In 1998, there was a huge bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef and huge sections of it turned completely white. But more than, um, more than 95% 
of the reef recovered oh, good. after that because it was it was caused by heat stress, but the heat stress was not too much for too long, and it came back. Okay, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So the term bleaching, it's not like we're pouring bleach on it. It's what happens when something causes the algae to change and the coral is reacting against that? Yes, and the coral is saying to the algae, get out of here. Okay, so what would cause the algae to go bad? There are several different things that can cause the that relationship to go sour. The increased temperature is mm -hmm. the only thing that causes mass coral bleaching where you have, you know, like kilometers and kilometers of coral reef that all go white at the same time. But the temperature getting too cold can cause the coral to bleach too. Oh. The water getting less salty, like if you have massive amounts of rain on land and there's a big flood and you have more fresh water going into the coral reef, that can cause bleaching. So if you have- it changes the salinity, that's yes, the right word. Yes, changes the salinity. If you have too much nitrogen all of a sudden in the water, like excess fertilizer runoff, that can cause bleaching. And if you have- um, Too many people peeing in the pool. That I suppose <laughs> could do it. <laughs> Although you would have to have a lot of people to like significantly change the nitrogen content of the ocean. That would not be easy, an easy thing to do. I assumed it was a local event. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of pretty much anything that changes the conditions of the water and significantly will cause a coral to bleach because it is a very delicate balance. And with the temperature, just raising the temperature of the water one degrees for a week, that can, that's usually enough to cause bleaching. So it's not oh, a wow. big temperature change, one degree Celsius. Yeah, well, I'm glad that it can recover because it's yeah. really kind of sad to see it all, all dead looking. Oh, it is, it is. It's definitely, definitely, we do, we do not want to have more coral bleaching than, than we've had yet. It's a kind of a scary thing. All right, are we ready for our quiz show? I think we are. All right, go to itempool.com slash science mom slash live and test your knowledge. We have several questions for you. And just for fun, we also have a see if you can guess where we're moving question that will come at the end. We do not have a birthday shout out today, but we do have something kind of special to celebrate today. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Science Mom. It's our 18 year wedding anniversary. So, woohoo! 18 years, crazy, huh? It is. <laughs> All right, for our first question, coral reefs occupy approximately what percent of the ocean, but provide a home for approximately what percent of marine mm. species? I'll be so impressed if you guys remember this one because I mentioned it just really quick right at the beginning. Mm. So is it 0.1% and 25%, 1%, 10%, 5% and 50% or 25% and 75%? No matter what, you know that the number of species living in coral reefs is going to be higher than the percent they occupy in the ocean. Yeah. But can you take a guess and guess the correct ratio? And they really do account for an oversized portion of the ocean life. They do, they do. Ooh, and Kara Rogers asked a great question. It's really interesting and cool that jellyfish don't have brains, but the, do they have something else? They do have kind of a primitive nervous system and they can like accept information and make decisions. Like, you know, if it's lighter over here or darker or hotter or colder, they will like navigate a bit in the water, but they're pretty simple animals compared to, to vertebrates. So a coral then would probably be pretty sim similar, right? They can they've got responses to stimuli, but probably not a lot of other thought going into them. Yeah, they're they're not gonna be like writing a book or anything. <laughs> nope. All right, the correct answer yeah. is yes. A. That's Good right. job. So 0.1% of the entire ocean. So that's uh, one in a thousand. Yeah. Oh, sorry. If you chunked up the ocean into little squares, one in a thousand we'll would have be occupied coral by coral. Yeah. But, they, but then, where you have coral, you have a ton of life. It was 25% of all the ocean species. Yep, in terms of, in terms of diversity. No. All right. Coral are most closely related to which of the following? Kelp, dolphins, seagrass, jellyfish, clams. We should, just, should use mushrooms. Mushrooms would have been a good Oh, mushrooms wrong, would wrong have been answer, a good one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of that. Hmm. I was thinking of things that lived in the ocean. Oh man, this isn't fooling then, too many. Um, good question from Finn. What would happen if you put bleach on coral? Would that cause it to bleach as well? 
And I think it definitely would because that would be a toxic chemo chemical to the coral if it's in high concentration and it would definitely damage it. So don't ever, don't ever bleach coral no. with bleach. That would be bad. No. I mean, you'd hope the ocean would wash it away pretty quickly and dilute it before it would do too much damage. Yeah. But, yeah. Most closely related to jellyfish. Yes, and that is absolutely correct. So if you ever see people talking about coral as being a plant, just say, nope. A whole bunch of upside down jellyfish stuck to a rock like that. That is a better idea of what a coral is than thinking of coral as a plant. Ooh. Okay. True or false, coral live only in the photic or sunlit zone of the ocean. Mm. So is that true or false? It's one of those two, but which one? <laughs> J Jackie says, for your present for our anniversary, we will crush Math Dad. Oh, I love it. Jackie. <laughs> Oh. He so Math Dad is very competitive and really loves competitions, but he is always happy when you guys knock the questions out of the park and get them right because that means that you guys are learning. It's it's, it's kind of a win win. I either you learned a lot or I crushed you. <laughs> so he's happy either way. <laughs> the answer is false, and that is correct because we saw deep ocean cold water coral that can live where there is no light. Those are not as common or as abundant as the coral reefs, although the more we explore the deep sea, the more we find. Well done. Ooh, okay, this is a multi-option answer. So coral bleaching can be caused by which of the following? An increase in water temperature, a decrease in water temperature, a change in salinity, a bacterial infection, or sea level rise of three millimeters per year. Getting put in jail by oh, those bars. Oh, oh. oh man. So which of these could cause coral bleaching? Four different categories are getting lots of votes here. And I really do hope, so there's only one of these can cause a mass coral bleaching where you have a huge, um, yeah, huge, huge area. And I hope that that one comes in first. I don't know. All right, let's finish and reveal. And they picked four categories and... And increase in water temperature came in first, and that is the one that can cause mass bleaching. And then sea level rise came in last. And it all depends on how fast the seawater is rising, because it actually turns out the coral can drown. And you might think, wait a second, that sounds ridiculous. How could a coral drown? Well, if a coral, all of a sudden, the sea level rises, let's say, 30 feet, and there's not enough light coming through the water, for that algae to do photosynthesis, then the coral would starve uh -huh. and it would and it would die. But if sea level is rising just three millimeters per year, that's a very small amount. That's actually the amount that we saw in the 1990s. Um, that is slow enough that the coral can just grow along with it. It can just keep growing that makes to sense. stay where the sunlight is. What about good. the bacterial infection? A bacterial infection can cause bleaching too. In fact, that first photo that we saw where one coral had bleached and the one right next to it was the same type of coral, same species, mm -hmm. and it hadn't bleached. A bacterial infection is a good hypothesis about what might have happened there, because if you do get that happening, that can cause bleaching too. Okay, this question is going to stump them because it's the weirdest question. <laughs> it's a great question. I like this question a lot. A bleached coral is most similar to a horse on a sand dune with nothing to eat, a tree that has lost all of its leaves, or a rock being weathered by the elements? It is a kind of a strange question, but I can make a very strong argument <laughs> that one of these three is a better analogy to bleached coral than the others. So I, I did not make up this question. I just, just <laughs> want to make that clear. But, Are you know, throwing me under the bus? I'm totally throwing you under the bus. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird question, but um, I'm anxious to hear your explanation on this one. I'm, I'm really curious <laughs> to see what our unbeatable science kids choose because it, in my mind there's a really clear analogy here. We'll see what they say. All right, All right. I'm go ahead and finish and reveal. Let's do it. And a horse on a sand dune with nothing to eat is much better than a tree that's lost all of its leaves. Let's go back to this camera for just a second and talk All about right. why. So when you have a tree that loses its leaves, like if you have a plant and you just like pop, 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 take off all the leaves. That's kind of like taking an animal and cutting hair or clipping fingernails. You know, you're, you're taking mm. part of the plant off, but the plant can regrow itself. 
So, if but, you, but it can't eat without its leaves gone. It, it can't photosynthesize, right? It depends on the plant. Oh. This jade plant right here, if I took off all of the leaves on the jade plant, the stem can still do photosynthesis. The stem is green. This one said tree. And a Palo Verde <laughs> tree also has green bark and can also do photosynthesis through its stem. All so right. it all depends on the tree. <laughs> A lot of a lot of plants, if you take off all their leaves, they can still feed themselves because they can do photosynthesis in their trunk. And even if they can't, they can fix the situation immediately because they can just sprout new leaves. But a horse that's on a sand dune with nothing to eat, it does not have any food. Okay, that's And it's true. going to be starving. And that's what it's like with coral. Also... <laughs> All right, Math Dad, maybe you're right to throw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> um, a, a plant can have food stored in its roots, and so it's not necessarily going to starve because it can pull nutrients from the roots, but the coral doesn't have any energy storage. It doesn't, mm. it doesn't have like roots where it can store energy. So that's why I think A is the best answer. But if you think that you can argue that B is the best answer, I say go for it. Write an essay about why B is the best. Just make sure that you back it up with some points. Yeah. Well, analogies are kind of fun. You, you, you try to find something that fits, and then you can say, oh, well, this part fits. Oh, that part doesn't fit at all. That's That doesn't match. And I think you can learn a lot just by trying to come up with an analogy. I, I should probably try to do that more often because it's fun to see what connections you have or what anti-connections you have that are the, the opposites. Exactly. All right, last question. This one is just kind of for fun. So many of you know that we are moving and have been looking for a house. We looked in areas all over the United States because we could relocate anywhere. And I want you to see if you can guess where we got a house because last week we finally had an offer accepted, which was very exciting. And we now know where we'll be moving. So options include Anchorage, Alaska, Corvallis, Oregon, Bellingham, Washington, Knoxville, Tennessee, Logan, Utah, and Roanoke, Virginia. And the common thread to all of these locations is that they they have a wetter climate. They get more rain than Las Vegas, Nevada, where we currently are. So science mom is ready to get out of the desert. I'm, I, I'm ready for more <laughs> water, more rain. All right. I, we do. So I'll, I'll be impressed if they can just guess this one right. But we have a top vote, and it is Logan, Logan Utah, Utah. got the most votes. And then next was Bellingham, and next was Corvallis. But the correct answer is Roanoke, Virginia. We're moving to Virginia. We are, which was not where I thought we would be moving um, even just two weeks ago, but we are very excited to be going to Roanoke, which is near the Blue Ridge Mountains and beautiful. And we found a, a house where we can do our work from home situation a little bit better, which is great too. So, woohoo! Yeah, big, big news for us. Now, now we've got to figure out how to carry out the move, but we're, we're excited. We are. All right, you guys, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed learning more about corals. And then on Wednesday, we will be talking about Venus and Mars and possibilities for settling on Venus and Mars. No. And I just want to say, this was the only time we really talked about an animal or any living things. Earth science had those four different areas. So we had the atmosphere, so the sky, the air. We had the lithosphere. Rocks. Which was the, the rocks part of the, the planet. We had the hydrosphere, the, our oceans, and then we really aren't covering the topic of the biosphere, the abundant plant and animal life across the earth. We're going to be getting to biology in the fall. That will be our, our main topic. It was just too much for us to get through, but we wanted to make sure we talked about maybe one little example. ecosystem, one example in this course. Yep. So join us for biology in the fall. We'll have more information about that soon. Work hard, grow smart, everybody, and we will see you on Wednesday.